Hi everyone, it's Nikki here and welcome back. It's the end of the month so it's time for another rundown of some of the books that I've been reading over the last four weeks or so. Uh, now it's quite a bumper edition today I have to say because I have 18 books to go through. Um, I'm actually I think something like seven or eight books ahead on my Goodreads goal at the moment which sounds really impressive but as you'll see as I go through these some of them were short reads um, that I finished within a day and it is nice to have that little bit of a buffer on my Goodreads goal because I do have a few, I think three or four on my uh, TBR pile that are in the 800 to 1000 page range which will obviously take me a bit longer so it's nice to be a bit ahead because then I'll drop back a bit again once I get to those in the coming months. Anyway, without any further ado, as it's going to be a longish one, I'm going to press straight on. Uh, the first three books I actually finished on the 31st of January, but obviously because I filmed these a day or two before the end of the month really to post them, uh, they just missed the last video. So the first of these is Kin, which is the first in the Helga Finnsdottir series by Snorri Christiansen. Um, it's an Icelandic family saga, but with a bit of a murder mystery thrown in. Uh, this one came from NetGalley and I gave it four stars. Uh, I did really enjoy the family drama side of the story, however the murder mystery part just never really gripped me. I didn't feel any tension over who the killer was or anything like that. Uh, I do believe it's going to be a series. I think she's going to go off now and um, solve mysteries elsewhere in, I in Iceland. So um, uh, we'll see. I, I wouldn't say I won't check out the next one, but it wouldn't be something I'll rush to. So a good read if you're into historical mysteries, I guess. The next book is one of those quick ones and it's a one that I bought myself and it's Paper Panda's Guide to Paper Cutting by Louise Fischel. Uh, five star read for me, it's a really great introduction, I'm just taking up paper cutting this year. Uh, it gives you lots of tips for the beginner, what you need, some technique and it's also got a few templates at the back that you can use just as practice to get you started. Um, I've done one of them and since then I've gone on and designed a couple of my own basic ones. So I may go back and cut out a few more of Louise's um, for practice in the future months as I work on designing some slightly more intricate ones myself. So if paper cutting is something you fancy, it's definitely a good book to check out. And the final one from the end of January was La Princesse Belle Etoile et le Prince Chéri. And this is um, a tale by um, Madame Dolnoy. Uh, it's a classic French tale, so um, I think it's I want to say 17th century? I think it is 17th century or early 18th. Um, it's a, basically a fairy tale. Uh, you've got a, a y young group of um, princes and a princess who are cast aside at birth because of the machinations of an evil queen and they're finding their way back to discovering their true parentage. And along the way they have to complete three tasks to find these fantastical objects. Um, and it's, it's a pretty traditional feeling fairy tale. There's a bit of possible but not quite incest. Um, and in the end, it's one of the things where the good win and the bad get their comeuppance. So uh, I read this one in French and it was quite a nice read for me. Um, I didn't really have to look anything up too much. The few words I didn't know, I could infer the meaning from the rest of the text. So uh, it, was, it was good practice to get back into some French for the year. And, Hopefully I can do a bit more later. But moving swiftly along, um, oh, I should say that was a bought copy as well and I gave it four and a half stars. But now moving along, the next one I read is another NetGalley read. Um, no I lie, I completely lie to you, it's um, one I picked up for free on Kobo um, back in about October. It's called Struck, it's the first in the Phoebe Meadows series by Amanda Carlson. This was a four star read for me. Uh, it's based around Norse mythology with a particular focus on Fenrir, um, the wolf, who's one of Loki's children. Um, and Phoebe is a, a young girl who suddenly finds out she's um, descended from the Norse gods. And as they're moving in two camps, one of them wants to protect her, the other camp wants to get rid of her. She finds herself travelling through the Nine Realms and meets up with Fenrir who becomes an ally. Um, I really loved the use of the Norse myth in the stories. One or two things niggled me at first. Um, the way the Norni are presented as these sort of evil witches um, doesn't really translate well with my idea of the Nornia. But once the story got going and I got into the idea of it, it's fine. 
Um, the only thing I didn't really like that made me give this four stars instead of five was it felt a little bit repetitive at times. There were some scenes where you kind of felt it was just the same thing taking place again. She's almost captured, she escapes, she's almost captured, she escapes. Um, particularly at the end, there was the last few chapters, it just felt like one chapter after another was just a repeat of the last one, essentially, but just with a different adversary in a different setting. But it was interesting enough that I would go on and read more if I get the opportunity in the future. Uh, the next one was another French one that I bought while I was over in England, Pour une nuit d'amour and L'inondation, and these are two short stories by Emile Zola. Um, I do like Zola, um, Therese Vacan is one I read when I was at school and really enjoyed. And these are, these are five star reads for me, they're beautiful short stories, um, really emotive and descriptive works, um, as you'd expect from Zola. So if you're into your classical French literature then definitely check it out. And again, a, a nice easy one, I looked up a handful of words throughout the whole thing and pretty much I could work it all out, so um, it's good for my French. And the next one another, is another of these quick reads, and the reason for that is it is a book of Icelandic grammar. <laughs> I know, exciting. Um, I really needed this book, so I've been starting to learn Icelandic, and I've come a bit stuck because, unlike even Danish, I'm able to find quite a lot of material for learning, particularly from a grammar and um, uh, verb table kind of sense. And Icelandics, I've really been struggling. It's hard to get decent dictionaries. Um, and this grammar book I'd been eyeing up for a while, but it was really expensive, and I finally just caved in and just got it recently. I had a bit of money for Christmas and birthday, I thought, no, I just need it. So I'm hoping it's going to help me improve now, because I've hit a kind of sticking point where I knew a little bit and I couldn't really get any further, and I was getting really frustrated. So I'm hoping that this book is going to help me out. So obviously it's not one I've read cover to cover, but um, I flipped through it and I'll be working through it during the year as I use it. Um, five stars, it's a really great resource, um, the best one I've found so far uh, in terms of setting out the different grammar elements. Um, it's also got some text and a bit of a glossary in the back as well, so uh, if you're interested in learning Icelandic, um, this book is by Stefan Einarsson um, and you'll want to check it out. So, moving swiftly along. Next up is another of these quick reads and it is a graphic novel, um, The Man Who Laughs by David Hine and Mark Stafford. Uh, now this is based on the Victor Hugo novel and you may have heard me in previous videos talking about the fact I saw this musical The Grinning Man while I was in London and that I've now been seeking out all the film versions and the books and various things relating to this story. So uh, this is one of them, the graphic novel, a uh, five star read. It was a really great retelling. Um, I liked their cuts and their edits. I think they made the story work well. The um, illustrations were great, and it's just a really nice one to keep as part of my um, The Man Who Laughs collection, growing collection. And another really short one next, and this is one that I bought as well, and it's called The Machine Stops by Ian Forster. Now it's a short story. Previously I've read um, a few of Forster's novels, um, Room with a View, Howl's End and the like. Um, this short story was delightful. It surprised me because I was expecting an Edwardian drama of manners, as most of his work is, but it's actually a sort of sci-fi fantasy story. Um, it's, it's quite a deep piece, it's looking at the idea of a future where everyone's cut off from each other and all communication is by machines, and the machine basically controls everyone's lives and they don't have to leave the room in which they live because the machine does everything for them. Um, but then you have the people that question that and say, is this really living? Um, I don't want to give away too much in case any of you read it, but it is um, a really wonderful piece. I was captivated from the start, read it all in one sitting, so uh, an awesome book. I mean, there's a lot of five-star reads you'll notice this month, it's been a really good month. Because the next one is also a five-star, and we're back to NetGalley now. And this one is called Forks, and it's by Nadine Brands. Now this is a really skillful fantasy retelling of the gunpowder plot, essentially. Um, our main character is Thomas Fawkes, who's the son of Guy Fawkes, and he gets embroiled in the plot because um, they, they kind of change it so that instead of Protestants versus Catholics, uh, everyone has these, these magical powers using colour with masks, and you have the sort of camp who think there should only be one colour per person, 
and you should only have mastery of one colour. And then there are the other camp who want to talk to what they call the white light, which controls all colours. Um, I thought the way she, um, or the way the author used the basic gunpowder plot storyline and wove it into this fantasy world, it worked really well. Um, it was a, a great fun take, I haven't seen anyone do the gunpowder plot in this way before. Uh, the characters are engaging, perhaps I would have liked to have had a little more explanation here and there on some of the magic, but um, that's a very minor complaint because it was a pretty enjoyable story from the beginning to start. Two more books that were also one day reads, and these are back to ones that I have bought. I'm going to mention them together because they are kind of related. Um, the Art of the Force Awakens and The Art of the Last Jedi. Uh, these are by Phil um, Sostak. Now these are books, as the title suggests, that are about the films, particularly looking at concept art and design that went into producing the movies. So not so much a making of as just looking at all the design elements and the um, ideas they had. For me, the Force Awakens one gets five stars and four stars for The Last Jedi. Um, the reason for this is, uh, I love both books, they're great coffee table reads. Um, I preferred the layout in Force Awakens, which went um, chronologically through, looking at the um, design. It also featured a lot of material that then didn't make it into the film, which was particularly interesting. Uh, on the other hand, you've got The Last Jedi, which grouped things in categories, um, and the, the sort of information from the creatives didn't really sit along with what was being shown in the next page and the pictures and things. And it also, it just felt like watching the movie in a way, because there wasn't so much um, material that didn't make it in, you were mostly seeing stuff that you recognised from the film. Um, it was also, for me, sadly missing quite a lot of the Kylo Ren stuff, and I think the reason for this is they said in the first, uh, in the first book they missed a few bits out from the end because they didn't want to do spoilers, and I guess a lot of the Kylo Ren and Rey stuff that happens in Last Jedi would be considered a spoiler, so they didn't want to put it in the book. But it does mean that, you know, you've got Kylo Ren, who's one of the most important characters in the film, and he only gets like a couple of um, design elements from his um, scenes included. So that was a slight disappointment, which is why it gets the four stars. I don't think it worked quite as well as the Force Awakens one. But anyway, moving on to another one I bought. Um, this one is called The Atom Station by Hador Laxness. Now, if you watch my videos, you may have heard me mention um, Hador Laxness before. He's an Icelandic author whom I adore. I think he's absolutely wonderful. This book is no exception, five star read for me. Uh, it's looking at when the US wanted to build a um, military base and atomic station on Iceland. And it's seen through the eyes of a country girl from the north who's come to work in the city in Reykjavik. So you're looking at the sort of differing opinions between the um, rural north and the guys in the city in the south. Um, it's dramatic, uh, darkly humorous as all of Laxness's writing is. Uh, he has quite a wry sense of humour that I love. And you also get a real fantastic sense of Iceland as a place and of its people. Um, it's not my absolute favourite book of his, but um, as I said, I still gave it five stars. It's still wonderful. So um, if you haven't read How to Laxness, that's my big tip. Read How to Laxness. Um, probably start with independent people uh, and go on from there. So, we've still got a few more to go. Next up, um, we're coming back to NetGalley now. The Song of Blood and Stone by L. Penelope. This is a four star read for me. It's a fantasy story about, um, again, it's kind of a divided nation. You've got these um, two groups of people, one of whom have um, a, a magic, an ability to, to sing, as they call it, um, and to um, make the earth move or to heal people and then the others are those who are silent, who have no song. It was a really great premise, I loved the idea. However, I did feel the ending was a little bit rushed, and there's obviously going to be a new, uh, another story, but it felt like a, a big rush to get to that ending and set everything up for book two. Um, and in fact, you, I think you could have ended the story without book two, um, but then the author added this bit in the sort of final chapter that created another story. But um, you kind of got to the point where everything was about to happen and a lot of it then happened off page. So we've got the bad guy there, she's got her song, is she going to be able to stop him? 
And then on the next page it's like the other guy arrives and he realised that so-and-so had been taken prisoner. It's like, when did that happen? It can happen to off-page. And uh, I was like, I, I would have liked to have seen that action rather than just be told about it. But it was still interesting, it's a four star read for me. If you're into YA fantasy, then it's probably worth checking out. Um, it had lots of good things going for it, it was just one or two things that niggled at me. The next one was another short read, and it is Be My Anti-Valentine by Alina Popescu. Uh, Alina's a good friend of mine, she'll be watching this video, and she gave this book away for free to her subscribers as part of her Valentine's um, offer. Uh, this was a four and a half star read for me. It's a really sweet short story um, about Jim and Brad um, who know each other, they've, they've been sort of friends for a while and they both liked each other but neither spoken up. So it's kind of almost a friends to lovers um, kind of set up and one day when uh, they're upset about Valentine's Day they meet up, end up doing some gaming together and uh, things happen from there. So I won't say too much to ruin it in case you're going to read it, but um, a really delightful short story, a nice easy evening read. Um, of Dogs and Walls was the next book that I read, and this is another net galley, and it's by Yuko uh, Shoshima. If I'm saying that right, hopefully. Uh, it's a four and a half star read for me. Uh, this is literary fiction, and it's a, a really beautiful piece. The tales, there's two tales essentially, and they're both really flowing. I love the way the imagery in each moved through and it, it kind of drew the story through timeline, through different generations within the family. Uh, it's one that's really hard to describe without giving giving the story away if you know what I mean. Um, but if, if you like literary fiction that's kind of poetic, lyrical, um, it's not necessarily a beginning, middle and end kind of set up but more just all these vignettes looking at this family's life then um, definitely check this book out. Uh, moving along, I read uh, The Sisters Medeiros by Patrice um, Sarath. Now, this is the lowest rated one for me this month, um, but it still gets three and a half. Uh, the idea is there's all these uh, merchant families, one of them's had a catastrophe, lost all their ships and been ostracised by the rest of society. Um, the two daughters of the family um, take matters into their own hands to um, prove that uh, there's a there's been a setup that uh, it wasn't their fault, and that all the things they've been accused of have actually just been a trick by the guild to disgrace them. Um, they go about this in different ways. One of them gets herself invited into society again and begins gambling, <laughs> and the other one takes off um, essentially as a bit of a highway highway woman or cut purse. Um, I loved the idea, and I liked the sisters' relationship. Um, however, one of the sisters has this magical power in her fingertips that produces this electricity and she seems to be able to control wind and water and things. But that's never fully explored. It's introduced as if it's going to become a major plot point and then it just kind of sits there and nothing really happens. We don't know why she's got the power, we don't know the extent of it. She kind of uses it a little bit but it's not really that vital to what's going on. So um, that kind of let it down for me which is why it gets three and a half. I think there was a lot of potential and perhaps it wasn't fully explored. The next one I read was The Diminished by Caitlin Sedge Patterson. Um, this is another net gallery read again. Uh, four stars from me. Uh, it's a YA piece. Um, the idea being that everyone's born with a twin, uh, except the single born, and they're usually the ruling um, royal class. If you are born with a, without a twin, or if your twin dies and you stay alive, you become diminished um, and potentially are going to go mad. So you have this um, scrappy young girl who's a diminished, a, dim a dimmy as they call her, and her story becomes caught up in that of Bo who is at uh, the edge of the throne, he's a single ball. So it, it's one of those where I can't say too much without um, ruining the plot, but it's, it's a pleasing YA. Um, again, it's one of those where the ending suddenly felt a bit rushed, there's a big build up and then suddenly everything concludes within a few chapters. Uh, but other than that, uh, I liked it. There's a little bit of a love triangle, but it's not the main focus of the story, so I liked that the author didn't go down that route. So, again, if you're a fan of YA fantasy, then it probably is one you'll want to have a look at. And that brings me to the last one for the month, and another five-star read to round things off for us. Now, this is a book my father sent me, he read and passed on. Uh, Call Me By Your Name by Andre Asselman. I actually saw the film of this before I read the book and when I went to see the film I didn't realise it was a book and then suddenly the 
parcel came in the mail, um, my father sent me the book. Uh, I gave the film five stars as well and it is an awesome story. Um, it's a coming of age plus coming out sort of tale set in Italy. Uh, it's beautiful, it's heartbreaking um, and lyrical and everything about the prose, it's very introspective. Um, so we're really getting the feelings of, um, of our main character, um, Elio. Um, and there's not much I can say about it. If you like literary fiction and LGBT fiction that's perhaps a little bit bittersweet but beautiful, then you're definitely going to want to have a look at this book. So that wraps us up for February. As I said, it's been a busy reading month. Hopefully next month we'll be back to more normal levels of 12 or so. Um, but it's been great. Loads of five-star reads, plenty to share with you all. And I will be back again in about four weeks and hopefully I'll have a few more good reads to um, talk about and to recommend to you then. Bye for now, everyone.